All right. Well, hello, everybody. Um, sorry for those that may, may have not realized that we don't have any sound until we actually start. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I guess, you know, good evening. Um, and as always, for those out on the West Coast that are able to make it squeeze their uh, schedules in to make it work just after work. Good late afternoon. Uh, and welcome, actually, to the first event hosted by the very new Laurier Centre for the Study of Canada. As always, I am your host, Eric Storey. I'm the Outreach Manager of the Laurier Centre for the Study of Canada and a PhD candidate in the Department of History at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Ontario, where I am today. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the extensive history of the land in which the Laurier Centre for the Study of Canada resides. Our office is located on the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Neutral Peoples. In 1701, this land fell under the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, a treaty that was part of the Great Peace of Montreal in the same year that marked the end of the Beaver Wars of the 17th century. It represented and continues to represent today an eternal agreement to not only share and protect resources, but also solve conflicts peacefully. Eighty some years later, in 1784, the Haldeman Proclamation was signed between the Haudenosaunee and the British Crown following the American Revolution, and the Haudenosaunee were given a tract of land that extended six miles on either side of the Grand River from its source just north of Orangeville today to Lake Erie. Despite being reduced to less than 5% of its original size today, this treaty territory remains the homeland of Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee communities, as well as the home of many Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island. Acknowledging their presence and relationship to the land in the past and present reminds us that these nations remain the original stewards um, and of the lands and waters upon which the Laurier uh, Centre for the Study of Canada resides and the role we all should play as treaty people. Before we begin the formal proceedings for tonight, which I know many of you are super excited um, to watch, as am I, um, I would like to briefly address um, why uh, or the fact that we are no longer named the Laurier Center for Military Strategic and Disarmament Studies. You know, for those who have been tuning in to um, our webinars since we launched in fall of 2020, or perhaps, you know, those who have been dedicated followers of us for any number of years, you might be wondering why. Why are we changing our name? And so what I wanted to do before um, we get to our speaker this evening is just turn the, turn the, um, the camera over to Dr. Kevin Spooner, who's the director of the Laurier Centre for the Study of Canada, to provide you with just a couple of words about the new name and what exactly that new name means in the months and years ahead for the centre. And before I, I turn it over to Kevin, I just want to impress upon each of you just one thing, and that is that military history at the new Laurier Centre for the Study of Canada isn't going anywhere. This new vision is more of a building upon uh, the strong foundations that have been laid by the Laurier Centre for Military Strategic and Disarmament Studies for three decades, and we have no intentions of leaving that behind us. But let me turn it over to Kevin, and he can provide you with a little bit more detail about, again, the new name, uh, and what that means for us. Kevin, why don't you, uh, the floor is yours. Let us know what this new Laurier Centre for the Study of Canada means for, for everybody here. Thanks, Eric. Uh, and thanks to everyone uh, for joining with us this evening. Uh, I'm really looking forward to John's talk tonight. Uh, before I came to Laurier, I was at Trent University in Peterborough, and I remember how John was a legend uh, in the community there. I won't be long in what I have to say. Many members of the audience who are long standing supporters of the center will have noticed that we have, in fact, as Eric has just pointed out, changed our name to the Laurier Center for the Study of Canada. For more than a year, uh, the center has been engaged in a process to transition to a broader mandate uh, that would allow us to continue all the great research, events, and programming that we've always done, while at the same time expanding into new avenues of research, communities, public and social justice and policy connections in Canada. We finally completed that transition in December with the launch of LCSC, as we've come to know it. 
I want to assure all the center's friends that War and Society remains a core research collective at the new center, just as Eric has said. All the existing programming that was done by the Laurier Center for Military Strategic and Disarmament Studies continues as part of the new center. And it's our hope that this new wider mandate is going to ensure that the center has a vibrant and enduring future at Laurier. I'd welcome you to cruise the newly designed website for LCSC. There you're going to find all the contents that you've come to know and appreciate from the former center, the podcast, the blogs, everything is there. Uh, and we'll also uh, hope that you'll find uh, some new and exciting features on the website as well, uh, particularly in the months ahead as we expand what the center is doing. We'd really hoped we might be doing these webinars live and in person by now. COVID hasn't cooperated, obviously. Uh, we look forward to welcoming people back to the Center for live events as soon as we possibly can. And the great news is the Center has actually been newly renovated at 232 King Street here in Waterloo. And we're now going to be equipped for live streaming our lecture series. So folks from far and wide are still going to be able to join us online, uh, though without the virtual donuts. We haven't quite worked out that part yet. By all means, if you have any comments or any ideas related to the center, I'd love to hear them. Feel free to email me anytime. Eric is going to put my email and the center's new website address in the chat for everyone. Please do check out the website. Please do email me if you'd like. And finally, let me just take one quick second here to acknowledge Eric, who does such great work organizing and hosting the center's webinar series. Thanks, Eric. And thanks to Matt Baker as well, who's always lurking in the background, making sure that everything goes off without a hitch. So between Eric and Matt, we're always in great hands at the center, particularly with the webinar series. That's all I'd like to say for now. Uh, back to the main event for this evening. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Kevin. Um, and of course, you know, we'd all like to acknowledge Kevin's great work that he's done in transitioning the center um, with its new name and its new mandate. He's been an instrumental part of that, and he was too humble to admit um, as much, but I would like to thank him as well. Um, but again, I, I want to thank our audience um, for sticking with us, um, you know, over these many years, of course, um, and in the transition from the pandemic from in person to virtual, and for this kind of brief preamble about what the new center means. Um, so thanks again for your patience. Um, but the real reason you're here is not to hear myself or Kevin talk about the new mandate of the center, of course, the real reason you're here is for our speaker tonight, John Boyko, and I will not hold you back any further. John Boyko has written eight books, including Blood and Daring, How Canada Fought the American Civil War and Forged a Nation, which was shortlisted for a Governor General's Award, and Cold Fire, Canada's Northern Front, which was shortlisted for the Defoe Prize. Boyko is an op-ed contributor and writes for the Canadian Encyclopedia, he also has degrees from Trent, Queens, and McMaster Universities, has served on and chaired many boards, and has been elected to municipal office. Tonight, he will be speaking about his newest book, The Devil's Trick, about Canada's involvement in the Vietnam War, uh, which we actually do have available for purchase tonight. I will share the link with you of where exactly you need to go to find the book, uh, but it's going to be available for you um, or available to you, sorry, for $32. So without any further ado, let me turn things over uh, to John uh, for uh, his presentation tonight. Um, hi, John, it's, it's great to see you. Um, just quickly before I, um, before, before I sign off, um, I'd just like to remind folks just two things. First of all, if you notice the closed captioning that's going on at the bottom of your screen and you're finding it a bit distracting, just click the CC button at the bottom of the window and you can toggle it on or off. Um, and secondly, if questions come to you at any point during this uh, conversation tonight um, that John is going to have with us, please enter it immediately into the Q&A um, rate again located at the bottom of your screen. Um, you won't distract him. He will not see it um, as he's giving his talk. So don't worry about being distracting. And of course, it will also allow you to enjoy the presentation to uh, your fullest extent. So that's all from me. Uh, let me turn it over to John for his talk on his new book, The Devil's Trick. 
Take it away, John. Thank you so much and welcome everyone. Um, I can't see you, but welcome. I am very happy the, to have received the invitation from Eric. And uh, originally, yes, we were supposed to meet face to face, but no one saw Omicron coming. So here we are and we will make the best of this. And I think we are all getting uh, tired of this but used to it at the same time. So we'll make it work. And uh, congratulations on um, on the new christening of the Laurier Center for the Study of Canada. I, I think uh, I think you, you do terrific work, have done in the past and, and, uh, and look forward to uh, additional work. So thank you to Eric and thank you to Kevin. And uh, I'd like to begin, I think, by, by telling you a little bit about how I came to this topic, the, um, the devil's trick. Um, how Canada fought the Vietnam War. Uh, a previous book, as, as Eric mentioned, was called Cold Fire, Kennedy's Northern Front. And, and it looked at uh, President Kennedy's impact on Canada and our relationship with the United States in the Kennedy years. And I was in Boston doing research at the Kennedy Center. And I, I found it interesting that I was, as I was wading through the, the archives, Almost every interaction between Kennedy and Diefenbaker or Kennedy and Pearson for just the, the few months that they overlapped as president and prime minister, and so many of the interactions between um, his cabinet and, and either the Diefenbaker or Pearson cabinet <coughs> talked about Vietnam. And of course, I knew about the Vietnam War. You could see the color of my hair. I knew a little bit about the Vietnam War, of course, for those of us who were uh, of the age that, that we at least lived through those years. And we have all seen and read, and some of us read research far more. But I found it fascinating that not that Vietnam was being mentioned, but that it was being mentioned in the way that it was being talked about between Kennedy and, and the, the Diefenbaker and Pearson's government. That led me to do more research gave me another trip to Boston, which was terrific, and a trip to Saskatoon in November to the uh, Diefenbaker archives, which is always interesting to spend time in Saskatoon in November. And what I developed was the notion that there are about six, we, we, we could slice dice as we all do, but there are six points that I wanted to make with respect to Canada's involvement in the Vietnam War. And it, the involvement was deeper and more complex, it was more long lasting, if I could put it that way, than what I had believed when I went into the research. And so I saw six elements that I wanted to take a look at. So the best way I thought to introduce those six elements to a reader was to allow six people to be the guides that would lead people into the various elements of the, of the story. And so what I'm going to do for this talk and what I did in the book is, is use these six individuals. Some are well-known, some not so well-known, some not known at all, and let them guide us through the six elements of the story. So let's begin. Brigadier General, Brigadier General Sherwood Lett was a fascinating man. Fascinating man. He, was, um, he fought in the First World War. He was wounded at Passchendaele. Uh, came back, got a law degree, attended Oxford, um, and and came back and and got his law degree and worked in Vancouver and and was a, a very successful corporate lawyer. When the Second World War began, he re-enlisted, went back, and he was wounded at Dieppe, uh, and then he was offered uh, a position on the Supreme Court and turned it down because he wanted to continue his service to Canada as, uh, as, as a military man. He led people into France two days after D-Day and received yet another wound uh, two days after, after D-Day uh, with the incursion into France. And that was the final wound that brought him home. And he rejoined his law firm, uh, became a partner in the law firm. And so there he was in Vancouver living happily ever after in 1954. Now in 1954, if we begin to look at what was going on in Vietnam at that time, then we see that that was the turning point. And, and I assume that many people know this story, but 
1954, the French, um, even before um, the, the fateful battle at Dien Bien Phu, had decided that they were leaving. They had had enough, at least the French people had had enough. Picture of the United States in 1969-70, that was France in 1953 um, and, and the early part of 1954. And they needed to leave. They, they, they had had enough of their over 300 years of colonial rule that were interrupted in a number of ways. We go into that detail, but it's enough to say now that the French wanted to leave and end their colonial rule. Now, how do you end a, a basically a nationalist war, a civil war, a colonial war, all at the same time, overlapping each other? How do you end a war peacefully the great powers met in Geneva and the United States and Britain and France and, and the Soviet Union and China, and they got together and they were kind enough to let Laos and Cambodia and the Vietnamese um, observe from the sidelines. Canada was there because part of the conference was also trying to end the Korean War, uh, which was fought in 1553. So, so it was about the same time. There were the, uh, uh, peace had been declared in in Korea, but the war had not ended yet. And so there was the conference that was going to end both wars. And so Canada was there because of our involvement with, with Korea. And we did what Canada was very good at in those years, what was later called the golden age of Canadian diplomacy. We were there as the helpful fixer, and we were there trying to do what we could to bring the various parties together. A lot of what Canada did at the conference was trying to get Britain and the United States to cooperate in a way that the Western alliance could, could uh, work with unity in, in how Korea and what's called Vietnam at that point, but the, uh, Southeast Asia, Indochina was going to move forward. When the Korean talks ended, um, the Canadians went home and the, the, how we were going to end with the Indo-Chinese, how they were going to end that conflict continue. It was finally settled and what was going to happen, again, I won't go into great detail, but what was going to happen was we were going to divide the, the country. I won't talk about Laos and Cambodia, important issues, but won't talk about it today. Um, they're going to divide Vietnam into two, temporarily at the 17th parallel. Um, Ho Chi Minh, the communist, would rule the north temporarily. And when he um, was ruling, he was to bring all of the guerrilla fighters, the Viet Minh, um, they weren't called the Viet Cong yet, Viet Minh were supposed to come north. Um, anybody from who was living in the north, Vietnamese people who were living in the north who wanted to go south could go south. Um, anybody who wanted to go north could do that. The French had to get all of their troops and all of their equipment and all their military hardware out, and they were given three. 300 days to do it. Now, the trick is that was complex. How do you get people who have been shooting each other for generations to stop and peacefully get along in order to disentangle themselves? Well, we needed not a peacekeeping force, but we needed somebody there to make sure that the rules were being obeyed, such as they were. And so it was decided that India would represent the non-aligned countries and that Poland would represent the communist world. And it was decided that Belgium would represent the North, but then, or the, the West. But then it was decided that Belgium had a colonial history too um, that was a little uncomfortable. And it was actually show and lie, Chinese show and lie, that recommended that the Canadians um, take up the mantle and be the Western representative. And that was agreed to. And so it was announced that there would be the International Control Commission, the ICC, would be set up and they would be given the uh, responsibility, the, the three um, would be given the responsibility of not being peacekeepers, um, more or less being traffic cops, um, crossing guards, if you will, um, with all of these movements of people and troops and equipment until July 1956, in which there would be an election, and then the Vietnamese people could decide for themselves how the world was going to uh, evolve from there. It was rather interesting, I thought, that um, the Prime Minister of Canada at the, at the time was Louis Saint Laurent, and he found out that Canada had been chosen for this job when he read it in the Globe and Mail. 
<laughs> Canada was not even given the, the dignity of, of being asked or even informed. It was simply a, a press release that was released from Geneva. And that's how we found out. There was long discussions in the Canadian cabinet about whether we should do it or not. And it was finally decided for a myriad of um, reasons that we, we must do this. We must do it to help the Americans. President Eisenhower said he wanted Canada to do it. We were um, developing our relationship with India in a way that was, was crucial. And so we needed to do that. Britain wanted us to do it. And we were, again, in this golden age, so-called, we were going to be the helpful fixer again and try to get these people to just get along. Um, so the external affairs minister was Lester Pearson at the time, and he knew about Sherwood Lett. He had actually gone to school with him at Oxford. And so he contacted Lett. Lett agreed, flew to Ottawa, and they had conversations there, flew to Britain, and um, had conversations there with the British um, um, for, foreign people, um, foreign first people, who basically told him, this will never, ever work. This won't work. No matter how hard you and India and Poland try, it is going to fall into chaos and civil war. Good luck to you, but it won't work. <clears throat> Lat arrived in Hanoi, and he learned the first thing about Vietnam was how stinking hot it was um, with, with uh, the humidity um, over 100%, if that is even possible. But I've read several sources over 100%. The air was like soup. And when he landed in Hanoi, um, he, was, he was met with a great ceremony and got into uh, a great white Russian-made um, limousine and driven from the airport to the Metropolitan Hotel where he's going to be staying. And the people were there three deep on the sidewalks, waving. There were red banners and flags. There were people singing songs. And he was smiling and waving out the window. He thought, what a terrific reception. Got to the hotel. Uh, him and, the, and the, the, the two aides that he was traveling with, members of the staff, walked into the hotel. And uh, they were greeted. And the hotel receptionist uh, said, oh, I'm really embarrassed to tell you this, sir, but the Russian ambassador is expected any minute. And that crowd is for the Russian ambassador, not for you. And I think what Sherwin Lett learned was the second most important lesson, besides the heat, was nothing in Vietnam is as it looked. Nothing is as it appeared. And nothing was. Lett and the Indians and the Poles did all they could to try to, to allow so many of the Northern people to move South and, and, the, and mostly Catholics who were, who were being uh, uh, mistreated in, in horrible ways because they were Catholic, allow them to move South. They allowed the transition of cities from one side to the other. Uh, and, and they allowed all of the French, they saw the French troops leave and they left ahead of schedule with all of their equipment. But the reports that he wrote back to Ottawa that were then shared with Eisenhower were interesting. The most interesting came when Sherwood Lett was to be beginning to prepare for the elections that were to happen in July 1956. In a number of reports, and it's interesting when you read these reports, you go to the archives in Ottawa and read the reports back when the archives were open uh, and, and read the reports, you can hear the desperation in his voice. You can hear him being more emphatic in what he is saying. And then the main point that he said over and over, including on a trip back to Ottawa, where he personally briefed St. Laurent and Pearson, was when this election happens, Ho Chi Minh will win. He will win in the landslide. <clears throat> the people in the North love him. The people in the South love him as well. He wants three things. He wants one united Vietnam. He wants all the foreigners out. And he wants him and the Communist Party to be ruling the country. And Sherwood Lett said over and over and then personally to them in Ottawa, this is what the Vietnamese want to all the Vietnamese, including the people in the South, because not only do they share those three goals, but Ziem, who is the uh, basically American puppet um, ruler of South Vietnam, is corrupt, and he is doing everything to turn the South Vietnamese people against him in the way that he is, is operating his government and, and treating the people of South Vietnam. So 
he said, Lat said to, to Pearson and to Saint Laurent, and this news was passed um, to Eisenhower. Despite the fact that the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, the communists are going to win this election, the election has to be allowed to happen. If it does not, if this election does not happen, or if it is rigged, like forget Trump, if it is actually rigged, then what we are going to have is a long and bloody civil war. <clears throat> because while the North Vietnamese have been moving back north, there are many um, places where they have been hiding uh, weaponry, hiding ammunition, and they, despite the fact that they found many of these things and got rid of the weapons, they knew that the Viet Minh would come back and this guerrilla war would begin again. And the war would end with a northern communist victory. Allow the election to happen and avoid a war. But Eisenhower and Pearson and Saint Laurent all said no, they were not going to allow this election to happen. We then had the interesting and um, deeply ironic situation where the communist Soviets, the communist Chinese, and the communist North Vietnamese fought for a democratic election. And the democratic Canadians and Brits and Americans would not allow it to happen. Sherwood Lett went home. The ICC continued under new leadership, but his, his term was over. He went home and took no satisfaction when he watched the election be canceled and he watched the civil war that he had predicted begin. So that's the first time that the Canadians told the Americans, here is how you can avoid a war. Let's skip ahead. That was 1954. Let's skip ahead now um, a full decade. It's now 1964, late 1964. President Johnson is now in power. President Kennedy, of course, had increased the number of um, so-called advisors, American military presence. In South Vietnam, he had propped up CM, eventually allowed CM to be assassinated, which, which caused a power vacuum and, and chaos in South Vietnam, which necessitated even more American um, personnel and American money and American war material into Vietnam. And it was tipping toward the point where Johnson had to either pull out or he had to go all in, one or the other. It's an interesting conversation that President Kennedy had with uh, with Lester Pearson shortly after Pearson became prime minister. He went down to uh, Hyannisport, and there were, there were meetings during the day with staff and with Kennedy and Pearson. And that night, um, Kennedy and Pearson were, were sitting enjoying a, a glass of uh, whatever they were enjoying. Um, Kennedy in his rocking chair and Pearson on a couch with a fire in the in, in Kennedy's house. And Kennedy was asking him about a number of things because he respected Pearson's uh, diplomatic um, history and his wisdom. And Kennedy said, what do you think I should do about Vietnam? And without blinking, Pearson said, I'd get out. And Kennedy said, well, any damn fool knows that. The question is how? Well, that's exactly the same question that Johnson had. He was told by advisors that we probably can't win this. They knew this in 1964. Um, the CIA had done a study at Johnson's behest that basically said that if South Vietnam becomes communist, then I don't, the, the CIA report said, it doesn't look like surrounding countries will fall, the old domino theory. And the domino theory is the reason that they were there in the first time place. You can't, it, it was partly containment to hold China in, but it was also trying to make sure that all of all of those countries, Thailand and Cambodia and the Philippines, all there, don't fall to communism. Well, he was told in late 1964, don't worry. We believe the CIA report said that this is simply not true. It will not happen. So the reason for being there was gone. The likelihood of victory was absent. But how do you do two things? How do you get out if you can get out? And how can you show people in the United States, in the United States Senate House, that you were at least trying to negotiate for peace, even if you're not? Well, he met with 
Pearson, Pearson now prime minister, um, in New York City. And they told everyone, they told the press, the media, that this was just a chance meeting, that, that uh, they both happened to be in New York at the same time. That was true. They met in a hotel. And Johnson told Pearson, I need an intermediary to go to North Vietnam and to um, negotiate with the North Vietnamese. I have no embassy there. I have no back channel communication. I have no way of speaking to the North Vietnamese. We want Canada to take on this role. They had already um, developed, here is the message that we want you to take to them. Will you do it? And Pearson said, yes. And then they left and they told the media that uh, with, that was waiting outside that basically they had just talked about um, issues involving the Great Lakes. I'm glad the politicians don't lie anymore. They always tell the truth. So Pearson was ready to appoint the next uh, ICC, International Controlled Commission, um, leader. And he chose the guy that would, would do this he had great long experience. And uh, the guy's name was Blair Seaborn. Blair Seaborn had, had uh, an, a terrific um, background. Um, he, he went there and uh, a great big, one of those great big white Russian um, limousines pulled up in front of, uh, in Hanoi, of what had been the French governor's mansion. He was escorted upstairs and in, and in this huge and ornate room filled with um, Vietnamese art and antiquities. Um, uh, the room was so impressive that he almost forgot while he what he was there for as he was enjoying the room itself. I, I, I can tell you all this detail because I met with Blair Seaborn in Ottawa um, only about five, uh, six, six months before he died. I got the honor of meeting with him. And while he was 96 years old at the time, I walked into his his uh, his, his room and uh, there he was with uh, CBC News World and, and on TV and a very well-read Globe and Mail scattered around behind him. So his wits were very much still among him. And he was able to fill me into some of the details that you, you can never get just from archival information. And so he said that, that the prime minister of North Vietnam came in and he presented, they, they spoke in French, and he presented Johnson's ideas and tried to get the North Vietnamese to agree to him. Basically, um, it was a carrot and a stick that the, the United States would leave and they would give uh, um, all kinds of uh, help. They would, they would give uh, economic help and mili even military help, um, um, aid, so that um, the North Vietnamese could be remain an independent country and, and uh, take care of some of their economic problems if they would allow the South Vietnamese um, to do the same and to remain an independent uh, democratic state. Well, the he spoke for about an hour trying to be as persuasive as he could. The North Vietnamese um, prime minister basically said that he would agree to everything um, except I don't need your economic aid. Blair Seaborn even offered Canadian economic aid and was told, we don't need it, we're just fine. Here's what will happen though. We want the Americans to leave. <clears throat> we will wait six months. We would even wait a year until we had an election and basically did what they were going to do in 1954, allow the Vietnamese people to choose their one government. Because our goals, he said, are what I said before, one united country ruled by the communists with the foreigners out. Now it's not the French, now it's the Americans to get out. Uh, they, they had a great meeting, very positive meeting. And Blair Seaborn then spent about three days, three and a half days, um, traveling in North Vietnam, in Hanoi, and also into the countryside, speaking with, with business people, speaking with politicians, local politicians, the mayors, and, and, and things like that, uh, um, and people running various little villages, people that were on the street, people in bars, people in restaurants. And he then wrote three long cables back to Ottawa that got shared with, with, uh, with Johnson that said, take this deal. If you do not take this deal, then what will happen is there will be a war and you will lose because the people believe in those three goals. 
the people will fight for those three goals. And they will eventually wear the United States down just like they wore the French down. And if it takes a generation or two, the Vietnamese people are willing to do it. They have been fighting for these, essentially for these three goals since the first invasion of Vietnam. Well, if you look back in your history, it was in 111 BC when the Chinese invaded. And the, the Viet people then and the Vietnamese people, the Indo-Chinese, whatever you want to call it as, as the national and, and words changed, but the people in that region had been fighting against the foreigners to get them out so they could have self-rule since 111 BC. The people in the West don't think like this. And this was the reports that Blair Seaborn wrote. He met with uh, Vietnamese leaders, the, the prime minister and a few more leaders, five more times. And each time, again, more emphatically each time, trying to say, we will not win. You can't understand the, the long vision of the Vietnamese people in the West where we think of a long vision is the end of this quarter or the next election cycle. He was ignored like uh, Sherwood Lett was ignored. And it was the second time that the Canadians had offered the Americans a roadmap to peace What is interesting in January 1973, when President Nixon signed the deal that essentially Henry Kissinger had agreed to, it was almost exactly the same deal that Blair Seaborn had said was the best deal possible back in 1964-65. The next person I want to talk about is a woman, and her name is Claire Culhane. Claire Culhane is not well known in Canadian history, although I don't think Sherwood Lett and Blair Seaborn are particularly either. Claire Culhane was um, a hospital administrator in Montreal. And when she read um, in her Saturday uh, newspaper in, in the Weekend magazine an article about Vietnam, um, and I don't know, I'm, many of you may remember, but when the Saturday paper came in, it was about that thick. And in the middle of that was, was a, um, a a little magazine called, called The Weekend, or Saturday Weekend, depending on what paper it was from, Saturday um, um, Weekend Magazine, different titles over the years. Um, I used to get it, and I used to cut out pictures of hockey players, you know, Gordie Howe, and Davy Keon up in my room. That's how old I am. And she got it, and there was a cover article that was talking about a Canadian hospital, Canadian built, Canadian financed, Canadian run by Canadians, doctors and nurses, in South Vietnam. And a new one was being built, a tuberculosis hospital, because the tuberculosis was running rampant in that area of the, the northeast portion near the coast of Vietnam. And she was so moved by this article that she contacted External Affairs and volunteered to go. And within six months, there she was in the hospital in Vietnam. And she was to, to be there for a year. Um, she worked um, not only as an administrator, keeping uh, inventing uh, a record keeping operation because it hadn't really been done properly before. And she also helped with the nurses. Um, she was there when the, when the Tet Offensive happened. She was um, walking through the wards late, late at night. And, and one of the patients called her, and, and again in French, um, said, uh, you must leave, you must go to safety. The Viet Cong come tonight. Everybody, everybody knew what was happening. Tet Offensive um, caused the evacuation of the hospital. Eventually they, they got it back when, when Tet happened as it happened. And after six months, she decided she had to leave. She didn't leave because of the horrors of the war. Although the horrors of the war were there and, and her, her archives are in McMaster University, and some of the things that she writes about what she witnessed are just horrible. I put some of them in the book, but, but a lot of them I, I couldn't put in the book. I, I just couldn't. It, it turned my stomach reading it. I didn't want to do that to my readers, some of the, some of the things that she witnessed. It wasn't those horrors that did it to her. It was the hypocrisy. She went back to Canada 
And they knew her already because she had been writing letters back to Paul Martin, the external affairs minister, the first Paul Martin, Paul Martin, the dad, the senior from Windsor. And when she got back, she thought, if only I could convince the government of what is happening here, they will stop it. And she wrote a long report about what was happening here. And then was baffled by the fact that the government knew exactly what was happening here. They didn't need to be informed. They knew they were just keeping it secret from the Canadian people. What was happening? In a report, she wrote, I'm paraphrasing, I can't remember exactly, but she wrote, how can one part of the Canadian government be doing such good work in financing and staffing hospitals while other parts of the Canadian government are overseeing an operation through which weaponry is being sold to the Americans to be used in Vietnam to fill those hospitals. She was taken on by the Voice of Women, who was the only national organization in Canada that was against the Vietnam War. She uh, self-financed a lot of this, and when she traveled across the country speaking at universities, at a number of the new community colleges that were being built in the late 60s. And she spoke in church basements. She wrote letters to the editor. Um, there's file after file at McMaster with all of the letters to the editor, magazine articles she wrote. She appeared on radio. She appeared on television. Um, she, at one point, to get more attention to her cause, had a 10-day fast on Parliament Hill um, right around the the um, the. the eternal flame. And a number of, of um, members of parliament came out and chatted with her, a number of curious tourists. She made international headlines. There were, there were um, news reports that I looked at from, from London, from even Moscow apparently was taking um, note of what she was doing. And the new ICC commissioner in, in South Vietnam, the Canadians were still there, not doing very much, but they were there, were noting how the North Vietnamese were noticing this and what Claire Culhane was doing. So she was drawing attention to this hypocrisy. A number of, of the members of parliament came out and chatted, and one of them was a very powerful man at the time, Jean Marchand, one of the three wise men, Trudeau um, and Peltier, and he came to, to uh, Ottawa at Pearson's behest to bring the Quebec voice to Ottawa. And he was the very powerful minister. And he began discussing with her what was going on and then debating and then into a shouting match with her because she was saying that basically in her research, she found that about $3.7 million a year was going toward, was being made through the manufacture of everything from boots to boot laces to guidance systems to the pins and, and grenades, the iconic um, green berets were being made in Winnipeg. Also what was being manufactured in Canada was Agent Orange and Napalm. How, she said, can we claim to be neutral in this war when all of our foreign aid is going to the South, hospitals and other things, and when we are making $370 million a year, $370 million a year made in arms sales directly to the Pentagon. That's not all arms sales. That's $370 million to the Americans of the Pentagon for use in the Vietnam War. How can we do this? And Marchand put his finger on it. He said, do you want to be the one, madam, to tell about 130,000 Canadians that they're out of work? because we are no longer gonna sell arms to the Americans. And there's the rub. 370 million, if you translated that from mid 1960s dollars to now is over $2 billion. Well, $2 billion, would, would we turn our back on $2 billion? And again, if you extrapolate the population, about a half a million jobs, would we do, no, about, about 300,000 jobs. Would we turn our back on 300,000 jobs and over $2 billion because we thought the war was wrong or immoral or unwinnable? I read cabinet documents. Uh, Paul Martin, for example, at one point in 1965, uh, made an interesting report in which um, near the end of 1965, in November, he said that Lett was even talked about, Lett was right 
And th this is, he had received the Seaborn report. And Seaborn is saying now that Lett was right, that the Americans will never win this war. So the Canadian cabinet knew in 1965 that we will not win this war, just like the Americans did. Pentagon Papers prove that. At the same meeting, he then talked about the sale of armored vehicles to Vietnam. So if that hypocrisy is okay, if we want to trade our principle for profit, that is okay. That is what Claire Colhane was bringing to the Canadian people. That's another element of how Canada fought the Vietnam War. Um, I live uh, north of Peterborough, Ontario, north of Trent um, University. And uh, Kevin and I were talking about that earlier. And what uh, is interesting, I, I, I have this friend of mine, I, I've known him for years and years, about I don't know, 20 years. His name is Joe Erickson. He's a great guy. He's a farmer. And, uh, and we became quite close. And it was a number of years ago. He we were out for a walk and, and he was asking me, so what are you working on next? And I said, well, I'm writing a book about the Canada's involvement in the Vietnam War. He said, oh, really? Did you know I was a draft dodger? <laughs> no, I didn't know you were a draft dodger. And so the chapter that I wrote on, on the, the people who came north, not only the draft dodgers, people avoiding the draft, uh, running before they got drafted, and the deserters, people who had signed up or been drafted and then left. Um, I let Joe Erickson's story tell that story. And I, and I think many of us know this story well, so I won't go on at the same detail uh, um, with, with this element of the story. But I will say that what surprised me was that while we were, we Canadians were welcoming um, so many of these young men and women, because um, something that, that uh, I sh should have thought of but didn't, is that many, many of these men came with girlfriends, wives. And so uh, a, a number of young women were coming here too. And the decision to come was not simply the man's. It was, it was as, as all good marriages and partnerships. It's, it's the two of them. And the women, the American women that were coming north is a part of the story that is often not told. The second thing that, that surprised me is that the polls that were taken throughout the time, and it got worse as the war went on, the number of people, Canadians, who did not want these people here. They did not want these Americans here. They, um, the polls said that many Canadians found them dishonorable. Many Canadians said that we don't want more young people coming up and tainting our young people. Because my goodness, they looked a lot like these long-haired hippies listening to horrible music and, and all of the rest um, of, of the uh, counterculture that was going on. We don't need these Americans coming up <coughs> and doing awful things and, and sending our good Canadian kids off in ways that we, we shouldn't be tolerating. And it is interesting that there were organizations in towns, cities all across Canada um, that were there to help them. Um, the bigger the city, the bigger the organization. Almost all of these organizations were tied to one of two things, and often both, a university. It was often university profs that helped set up an organization um, run by volunteers that would welcome these, uh, these war refugees and then help them to find housing and work and, and how to acclimatize um, to Canada. And also not besides the university with churches, church groups were very, uh, well, they were crucial to this in terms of offering financial and logistical support. But what is interesting is that polls were taken in the churches as well. Catholic, Protestant, like all of the churches, the, the um, synagogues did a similar, they didn't, didn't call it polling, but they, they asked their parishioners. And it was really interesting that the majority of the people in the pulpit believed that it was the right thing to do. It was the Christian thing to do. It was said in so many of the documents that I read, it's the Christian thing to do to help these people. But the people in the pews, the majority of them disagreed for the reasons that I've said. Um, the story that Joe told me that was interesting was that, I forget the exact year right now, I think it was 2002, it was 2002. 
um, he was going to a high school reunion. He was from Missouri. And he had been here since 1968, originally in Winnipeg and then Toronto, and then just uh, farms set aside people. And he was stopped when he got to the border. And he was questioned for over an hour in a locked room. And they were asking him questions about his past. That he had no idea how they knew what was going on. This is 2002. He was in the 60s. And the 60s were having their revenge. It was interesting that when he, he, he finally was let go with no explanation. And he made it down and he talked to his sister. His, his parents were both dead at that point. And he talked to his sister, Beth, who I got to meet and spent some time with. And Beth said, oh, that's that old FBI thing. What is interesting, I found, through Joe, is that when, not all, but a great many of the draft dodgers left as Joe left Missouri in 1968, the FBI harassed, there was no better word for it, that harassed the family for information. And at the same point, we're giving disinformation to the parents, trying to get them to get Joe to come home trying to get the parents to persuade their son to come home by telling the parents about all the awful things that Joe was doing and the awful organizations that Joe was, was involving himself with. And it was all a lie, but the parents were being harassed. The sister, Beth, was at the University of Missouri at the time, wrote a paper about the FBI harassment. And the FBI were at her door two days after she submitted that to her prof, asking her about her loyalty. So another aspect of the draft dodgers that I think is interesting is what happened to the families, the American families. There's a lot more research to be done in that area. I went to just outside of Ottawa, a place called Carlton Place, and I met with a man named Doug Carey. Doug Carey is a, a fascinating man, fascinating man, intimidating as all hell. Um, here I am, this a little skinny author guy, and I'm meeting with Doug Perry, a big, big man, an intimidating looking man, who I learned when I got to know him a little better is, is a gentle and a kind soul. He was one of about 20,000 Canadians who went the other way. He enlisted with the Marines and did a tour and a half in Vietnam. About 20,000 Canadians did the same thing. I listened to his stories, I looked at his pictures, spent a lot of time with him, and then I did a lot more research to talk to other people. And it looked like they went for one of three reasons. Uh, he was living in Oakville at the time. He had, um, just got out of high school and was in, in those high school days. I didn't have him, I just went on to university, but he was looking at what, what should I do with my life, um, traveled across Canada. Um, and he was watching the news with his grandmother, and there was a story about Vietnam because every night at six o'clock, you turn on and you watch the war. And then the, followed by a story about draft dodgers. And he said to his grandmother, I'm enlisting, I'm signing up. Why? Because every male in his life, almost every male in his life, I'm talking about his father, his uncles, his grandfather, both grandfathers, um, the, the teachers at his school, the mechanic, the barber, almost all were veterans. They had fought in the Second World War. They fought in Korea. Doug said to me, I saw joining the military and not just joining the military, but fighting in a war as a ticket to adulthood. It was something that I simply needed to do so that I could say, I too am a man. <coughs> like all of the other men in his life. I found that was very common. Um, another the second reason that a great many of the uh, 20,000 Canadians that enlisted, why they did so, was similar to uh, um, Jacques Destros, um, his son um, signed up. And the reason that he signed up was that he said, we have been told our entire lives that communists are, are evil, Communism is evil. It must be fought whenever we can. It was in cowboy movies. It was in space movies. Because you know, it wasn't really about space or cowboys. It was about fighting communists. It was in on um, the things that the politicians were telling us. 
better to be dead than red. So if we are going to be actually patriotic, we need to fight against communism. Where is the only place where the West is fighting communism directly in the middle of this Cold War? Vietnam. So off Jacques Dextro's um, um, son went to Vietnam, fought um, with the Marines, and he died there. Um, Dextro was Canadian uh, chief of defense. Is it not interesting that our chief of defense staff had a son fighting in Vietnam and died there? Doug Carey um, served, as I said, um, a tour and a half in Vietnam as a Marine um, with the same kinds of stories that we've come to know through books and, 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 and movies and, and other things. Um, he returned not because he was wounded, but because a mosquito got him. And he got um, Japanese encephalitis that just about killed him, um, came home. And when he was home, he found that he was suffering from the same thing that a great number of the American uh, vets and a great number of the Canadian vets were suffering from. And that was trying to emotionally recover from that war. The PTSD was such that he couldn't hold a job. His marriage almost fell apart. It did fall apart for a while. Um, and what help did the Canadian government give? Zero. What help did the Legion give? None. They wouldn't allow Canadians to even join. It was really interesting, the fight that the Canadian Vietnam vets had for some kind of recognition. They fought to have a monument built. They fought even to allow them to put a wreath down at, um, at the ceremonies in November, and the Legion would not allow them to have. Finally, in Windsor, there is uh, there's the monument, and there's another one in Quebec, just south of Montreal. But that was years later. Doug Carey was telling me that he's a golfer. He's in the 70s now, late 70s. But he's still an avid golfer. He gets out twice or sometimes three times a week. But he said, but in my course, there are three um, fairways where there is dense uh, trees, forests on both sides. And he said, no matter how hard I try, I cannot walk down those fairways without my eyes darting in looking for danger. And if I hit my ball into, into the woods, it stays there. I'm not going in there. He said, because I feel my heart racing. I feel the adrenaline. The PTSD is still there. So for the Canadians that fought, the war is still being fought. There are about 160 Canadians on that slash of marble um, in Washington, D.C. There are 100, about 160, about, I say, because it's, it, once we get into tricky of who, who, how do we define Canadian. So that's another way in which we fought the war. The finally, the, the sixth and final, Rebecca Trin. Rebecca Trin lives in Calgary, and I called her, and uh, we spoke on the phone um, many times, and I spoke to her, uh, her two daughters. Rebecca Trin is one of the thousands of, of Vietnamese, Cambodian, Laos, um, if I can call them Indo-Chinese, that's not correct, but you know what I mean if I say Indo-Chinese, um, refugees that left in the first wave when, when the uh, communists came and took over in 1975, uniting the country one government and foreign or so. And then in the second wave, that's when Rebecca Trin's family needed to leave. There was this border skirmish with the Vietnamese and the Chinese. And as a result of that, the Vietnamese government turned against all of those of Chinese ethnic origin. And that was the Trin family. Um, they were a middle class family. She wrote in a newspaper. She was a, um, a journalist and uh, the father um, ran a, a small independent business. Um, they needed to leave. They needed to run. I won't tell you about their whole story, but you can understand the horrific story that they had by this one part. They were, they were on this ship, uh, boat, big boat, 134 people, and they were really close to Indonesia with, with all of the refugees. They could see the palm trees at Indonesia on the beach um, when um, an Indonesian naval vessel pulled up beside them, threw a chain onto their um, ship, and threw a bullhorn and said, we're taking you back into international water. They did. They then let the chain go and said, go that way. In three days, you'll find land. Probably sending the Philippines. The captain realized they didn't have food and water to make that trip. They would never make it. So he made his way back north and eventually found a moonless night where he got close to shore 
about 3,000 yards from shore. And he said, um, all right, I'm going to coast the ship in as close as I can, grab anything that floats, jump and swim. That's your only way out. So I want you to picture this. There was Rebecca Trent. Um, her husband jumps. It'd be like jumping off uh, two, out of a two-story building from the deck of the ship onto the, the inky black water. He then yelled back up, throw Helen. Helen, um, uh, throw Judy. Judy is, uh, is uh, six years old. Grabs Judy, throws her up in the air. She hears a splash and Sam has her. He yells, all right, throw Helen. Helen is two years old. Now, picture as a parent. How am I going to do this? She takes the two-year-old, throws her up into the air as high as she can throw her, jumps down into the water, scrambles back to the surface, feels a splash beside her, grabs and saves her child. And they swim to shore. They eventually find their way to Calgary and then to Edmonton and then back to Calgary again, where, where I was speaking with her years and years later. It is interesting that the method that the Canadians developed in order to save these people was the same that was used to bring in the Syrians when the Syrian um, episode happened, if I call it an episode, the civil war, the, the horrific events there that sent so many refugees our way. Canada's system that we use there is the same that is used in many other countries around the world now where the government um, will partner with, with small groups or even with uh, groups of individuals. Um, I don't know if, if anybody watches The National. At, uh, I used to watch it at 10. I watched it at 9. <laughs> um, every once in a while, you will see a, a young woman come on, and, um, and then she will say, and this is Judy Trent for The National. That's the six-year-old that got thrown off the side of the boat. It is interesting that Helen and Judy um, both sponsored the Syrian refugees. So we know a lot about that story. I won't go on. I want to conclude. And I'll conclude in just about two minutes by saying the lessons that the Vietnam War taught us. Because the Vietnam War is still very much with us. And I think there are four. I think it affected our soul, our heart, our wallet, and our brawn. With our soul, it affected who we are as Canadians. It is interesting that um, Peter C. Newman, um, the journalist, wrote in 1972, he found it interesting that the Canadianization of Canada came about as a result of the Vietnamization of the United States. The trend where we are going to be less like Britain and more like the United States ran smack up against the Vietnam War, and all of a sudden we started looking at, maybe we should be more Canadian and less American. Maybe the Americans are not something to be emulated after all. It showed our heart. I've just talked about the refugees. And I talked about the refugees that came from the war, the draft dodgers and the deserters, two very different groups of people. Yes, the poll number said that they didn't want the Canadians, the majority of Canadians didn't want the, the uh, draft dodgers and deserters, and the majority of Canadians did not want the Vietnamese um, and Laotian and Cambodians here either. But we took them. We took them, we did the right thing. And I think that is something that says something about the Canadian heart. It also says something, the third lesson, if we talk about our wallet, I talked about Claire Colhane. Right now, um, there is a war going on in Yemen. Um, the Saudis are, are doing things in Yemen that our government has said um, is immoral and has spoken harshly against the war, not only in, on the floor of the House of Commons, but at the United Nations. But at the same point, we are selling over a billion dollars worth of war material, mostly uh, um, military vehicles made in London, Ontario. We are selling to the Saudis for use in the Yemen war. So it looks like we didn't learn that lesson of Vietnam very well. We are still willing to trade principle for profit. 
And finally, Braun. It is interesting that the golden age, what is called, was called um, the golden age of Canadian diplomacy, basically the end of the Second World War um, with Pearson and so many others in, in, in that department, um, these, uh, these uh, Anglo-Oxford educated, um, very intelligent, um, hardworking people who were using everything that Canada had um, the wealth that we came from of, out of the war and the fact that we could enter into agreements and try to bring people to the table in ways that they might not otherwise do, like the UN and NATO and a number of organizations. Um, it really, what Vietnam really proved was that if that golden age had indeed existed at all, the Vietnam War buried it because we were ignored we were ignored with Sherwood Lett. We were ignored when uh, when we tried to implement the piece that uh, that Blair Seaborn talked about. Um, essentially, what happened was every time that the Canadians spoke at all, and we could I could retell you the story of Johnson and Pearson if you want, but um, anytime we spoke up at all, we were chastised for having doing so or ignored. When Trudeau um, the first Trudeau prayer, Pierre Trudeau, spoke in 1973, late 1972, against the Christmas bombing that was going on at the time. Um, it, it, it was ignored. What it proved, what was proved by the Vietnam War, is that we are big enough to be independent. We are big enough that we can state what we believe without worry of repercussions, economic repercussions coming from the Americans. After Pearson spoke against the Vietnam War, not the whole war, but the bombing, the tactic that was being used, the auto pack was signed. A number of other trade agreements were done. We can stand up for ourselves and for our principles without worry that there will be economic or diplomatic repercussions for the Americans because we're big enough to be independent and we're small enough to be ignored. So, what I have done, I hope, is use those six people to talk about those four lessons. And in so doing, talk about the devil's trick and there should be um, how Canada fought the Vietnam War. I thank you for your attention and I am really happy now to answer any questions the best I can. Eric, over to you. Well, thanks so much, John. Um, that was a, a tremendous talk. And I, I'm always jealous of those that are able to give talks without PowerPoints on Zoom. Uh, it's, a, it's, a tough, um, it's a tough go, I think, for a lot of us, but I thought you did it just masterfully tonight. So thank you very much for such an entertaining um, and enlightening talk. I had a, had a lot of fun uh, and learned a lot. Um, why don't we start off um, with the first question that came in. Um, John from Bob Agerholm. Uh, I know he's he's come to a number of our talks um, over the past, I guess, over a year and a half now. Um, and he's wondering, John, if you could speak to um, Max Hastings' recent book on the Vietnam War and why, in particular, um, Hastings does not touch. And this is, I think, this is a, a question we usually get uh, when we talk about Canada's involvement in some other nations' conflicts. Um, is why Canada's involvement isn't acknowledged. I don't think Canada's involvement is acknowledged by Hastings or by a number of other American historians because basically Americans um, are rather myopic um, and that's off generalization to make. I'm embarrassed for making it. But um, from the American point of view, the uh, Canadians were there, like I was explaining with Lett, but the ICC was to be ignored. Um, when Kennedy, for example, was wanting to send um, a more troops to, uh, to Vietnam uh, and trying to send way uh, more, not way more, but more military equipment um, in terms of he wanted to send helicopters in and a lot more um, support uh, material that was needed for the helicopters. Um, he contacted the Canadians at the ICC and said, uh, I'd like your permission to do this. And the Canadians said, yeah, go ahead, but um, could you not send it all at once? Could you send it in three loads so it is not noticed? 
And so the Kennedy administration said, sure, and sent it in. So why are we ignored? Because we can be ignored. Um, we were simply there. And from the Canadians' point of view, as I have oh, hope I've expressed, we were there trying to do good things and trying to stop a war. The Americans were there um, for much different reasons. Um, I read to try to get, um, pres this is still answering your question, believe it or not. I read uh, at President Nixon's memoirs, RN. And I thought, okay, let's get his point of view of, of the Americans in Vietnam. And I had some trouble finding it. So I went to the index and I looked up Canada in, uh, in the memoirs, not even mentioned. We're not mentioned not even once in, uh, in Nixon's two volume memoirs. So that uh, Max Hastings didn't mention Canada, <coughs> doesn't surprise me um, because Canada is small enough to be ignored. It doesn't mean that what we did was not significant, but from the American point of view, it doesn't matter. John, the next question comes from Brad T. He's currently in Austin, Texas, but he's actually going to be uh, joining us here in Canada in BC mm. this, this year. Uh, so Brad, we, uh, we welcome you in advance uh, and we hope that you'll stick with us here at the Laurier Center for the Study of Canada in the weeks and months ahead. His question to you, John, is that Australians and New, New Zealanders went to Vietnam. Being the immediate neighbor of the United States, how come Canada was able to avoid making such a commitment of soldiers? Um, we were able to do uh, When I read about uh, at the Kennedy Center about Kennedy's coming to uh, Diefenbaker and uh, he met in Ottawa in May of 1961 and he tried to uh, get Diefenbaker to send troops to Vietnam. And Diefenbaker said no, um, because the ICC is there. We are part of the ICC. And as a result of being a part of the ICC, we have to be neutral. So we can't send troops. Australia was not part of the ICC, so therefore they could send troops. Um, Johnson tried uh, through a, a program called Many Flags to get other countries to send troops, and some did. Often what happened was, like the Philippines, for example, he gave them millions of dollars in aid um, so that they could then send a few troops. He didn't care that there were troops on the ground. He wanted, it was even called many flags. Johnson wanted to be able to say that this is not just the United States. Australia and New Zealand both sent troops there. They sent, Australia sent, I think, 58,000 troops there. Um, they even had the draft in Australia. There's a, um, a man that I was... Um, speaking with during my research, who was drafted in Australia um, and was about to go to Vietnam. And his parents said, forget that and um, fled to Canada. So we had draft dodgers from Australia in Canada as well. Um, I, had, I tried but couldn't find the numbers. So essentially, the Canadians wanted to maintain neutrality. We did not see the value in going to the war um, with respect to sending troops to the war. We were making enough money sending material and we used the ICC as an excuse to stay out. And thank God. <clears throat> uh, next, next question to you, John, from Nick Small in Mississauga. Um, he's wondering, and this is a, a theme of a number of questions kind of follow along this theme, so I'll, I'll follow up with, uh, with a number of these afterwards. Uh, next question is, how were Canadians received by the American soldiers they fought with in their unit and also by the Canadian public when they returned home? Uh, yeah, two very different questions. The Canadians were welcomed by the Americans were there. Um, the Americans, this according to Doug and, and um, Doug Carey and a couple of others that I spoke to, is that when it became known that they were Canadians, um, the people who had signed up for the war welcomed them and the people who had been drafted, the Americans who had been drafted said, are you crazy? <laughs> if, if I had my choice, I wouldn't be here. Um, so they were welcomed and they simply became part of it. And what Doug Carey said is it, it often didn't matter. It didn't matter. You, you became brothers um, and uh, you, you fought together as brothers. He said you, when you got there, and of course, I think we've, we've read enough books and seen enough movies that we know that when, you, when the men got to Vietnam, the average age is 19. So a lot of them are 18, 19, 20-year-olds. They're kids. They're children. Um, and when they were fighting, they weren't fighting 
communism. They weren't fighting to destroy and then save South Vietnam. They were fighting to survive, to make it through their, their 12, or if you're a Marine, 13 months, and you were fighting to save your brother and your comrade. And so therefore, if they were from Canada, it didn't matter if you were from Austin, Texas, um, or you're from Canada, you were one of the brothers that were there trying to survive and trying to help me to survive. Um, I've already forgotten the second part of your question. Oh yeah, when when they arrived back, yes. Um, the um, spitting on the on the soldiers that arrived back was more than just apocryphal. It happened. I, I spoke with a, a person who said, and, uh, a Vietnam vet who said, yeah, it happened. He said they didn't hit me, but they hit the guy two ahead of me, and they were spitting on him. He landed in California. It was the number of people from UCLA were protesting against the war, and they were calling them baby killers and spitting on them as they went uh, as they arrived home. Um, it's interesting that Doug Carey arrived home after hospitals in Vietnam and then in the United States because of the Japanese encephalitis. Um, and he was taken home and he landed in Toronto, um, still in a wheelchair and, and uh, having lost over 75 pounds, um, but recovering. And so when he landed at uh, the Toronto airport, what is now Pearson, um, he t was talking to one of the stewardesses who was asking him, like, are you okay? And, and uh, he said, no, I'm coming home from Vietnam. Um, it was a couple of minutes later, the, uh, the, uh, the co-pilot came back and sat with him and said that his brother, another Canadian, was fighting in Vietnam. And when, he, um, when the plane landed, the captain came on and said, we have a hero on board who was a veteran of the Vietnam War. If you could all remain in your seats two RCMP officers came onto the plane and helped him off the plane, pushed his wheelchair and, and got him through customs. So everybody had their own unique um, experience in coming back. The thing that almost all talked about, however, the Canadians that came back was being forgotten, being ignored. The experience is like it never happened. They weren't um, welcomed when they talked about it. Um, and so many, because they were suffering PTSD, didn't want to talk about it. So it was coming back to a vacuum and somehow um, being so emotionally damaged as so many of them were trying to recover and carry on with their lives. That was the common theme. Picking up on, on soldiers returning home, John, a question from Karen Almadi from Calgary. I'm sorry, Karen, I forgot your last name wrong. Um, but she's wondering, for those Canadians who um, fought in Vietnam and returned, did most return back to Canada or were, those, or were there some that eventually ended up in the United States or just returned to the United States directly? Yeah, that's why I say um, how many Canadians are on the Vietnam Wall, and it's somewhere between 79 and 160. That's a big range. <clears throat> this goes back to another question. Why do the Americans ignore us? Because 58,000 Americans died in the Vietnam War. And so when we say, yeah, but 160 Canadians, they say, mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the, and why can't I say this is the precise number is because it is very difficult to define who was a Canadian, who wasn't Canadian. If you were Canadian and you were working in the United States and you had a green card and then you had been working in the United States for a year or two or whatever, and then you signed up, well, are you still a Canadian? Um, a number of Canadians went over the border um, and signed up. Uh, John Kerry signed up in Buffalo. There was there was um, a number of uh, places in, in Dakota and in, in um, New York State where they would they would set up specifically to sign up Canadians. Um, and when you signed up, they often tried to hide where you were from by saying that you are from Buffalo or you're from where whatever city you were signing up in. So were those people still Canadians? Because all of a sudden this looks like they're Canadian, or they look like they're Americans. Um, there were two Canadians that I, I read about. They, they both passed on. I couldn't speak with them, but where, and this was pretty common, and they did with, with Australians and New Zealanders too, is that halfway through your first tour, they would say, would you like to become an American citizen? They would fly you to Hawaii. Um, and this is, <laughs> yeah, here, son, would you like to leave the jungle and spend a week in Hawaii and become an American citizen? Okay, you're 19 years old. What are you going to say? Um, a number of them, and I could, again, I can't get an exact number, um, signed up 
took the oath and became American citizens and then went back and, and finished their, their service. Some came back to Canada, some the, stayed in the United States. So are they still Canadians fighting in the in the Vietnam War? So um, this is a long way around to answering your questions um, because the answer is we don't know. And there's no way to say how many um, came back to Canada um, and how many stayed in the United States don't know. Um, another book that I wrote that Eric and I were discussing a little while ago was called Blood and Daring about Canada's fighting this American Civil War. And it's a similar thing, about 30,000 Canadians fought in the American Civil War. But again, about 30,000 Canadians because of the same issue. How many came back? How many stayed down? And, and the whole issue with um, defining nationality even harder in the 1860s than the 1960s. You're right, John. It's it's a, a really hard question, right? And especially when, you know, what defines someone who, um, you know, is Canadian or back in the 1860s, a British North American, um, if that person identifies as being, you know, from Canada West or Canada East, um, but was born in the United States, how are you supposed to parse that out without someone explicitly telling you as much, right? Exactly. Um, this next question, John, I think we'll probably have time for maybe two more questions. Okay. Um, this, uh, this next question, and I'll, I'll say to those that, that asked questions or entered questions into the, uh, uh, into the Q and a, um, if, if you would like to have your questions answered, John, if, if it's okay with you, I'll encourage those to send me an email of those questions and I can forward them along to you. Um, and you can answer to them on your, on your time. Sure. Um, but the, the next question comes from uh, Jason Anthony in Meaford, um, and he wonders if draft, do if draft, draft dodgers sorry, uh, were ever investigated as communist symp sympathizers during the McCarthy era. Uh, yeah, they were. <clears throat> and um, I, I guess I could look it up right now. I can't remember the exact quotes, but there were um, a number of uh, civic leaders uh, radio personalities, television personalities that decried the draft dodgers as communists, um, as uh, hippie agitators that should be thrown out because of um, the fact that they were Americans, they were cowards. Um, if they are running from their country because their country needs them, who knows that they would support our country if they were asked to support our country in any way. Um, the mayor of Montreal, mayor of Toronto, said awful things about the draft dodgers and the hippies um lumping them together and hippie is anybody who had hair like i had in high school that <laughs> was <laughs> brown and curly and on my shoulders and um listening to the music i listened to um and the mayor of vancouver said horrible things about the people who were going to university at the time of protesting against the war not all the um but the ones that were protesting the university students and what he called the hippies and the draft dodgers. And he said, the only problem our city has today is the hippies and the draft dodgers. And I'm going to make sure I get rid of them all. So it was, um, we, we look back, many of us can look back as the 1960s night as an idyllic time, but it was far from music was good. I've heard about the Vietnam war at the best soundtrack. I took a, a course at uh, the University of Saskatchewan in my undergraduate degree, um, and I think one of our courses on the during um, or on the Vietnam War, I think we focused uh, in a class just on music. Yeah. Um, so I can definitely say that that was a fun class. Uh, yeah. to do that. Um, so, John, I think um, you're a great you're very succinct in your answers, which is great because we can cover so much. Um, why don't we try to sneak in two more for you? Um, so try to be as, as, as succinct as you have been. So we well, can I noticed, I noticed one, I cheated and I looked at the question. So somebody okay. asked me about the devil's trick. Um, and I can answer that question very succinctly and I'll read you the first paragraph, very short paragraph. Here's the first paragraph in the book that answers that question. Why is the book called the devil's trick? And, and it, the book begins like this war is about sending our children to kill theirs. The devil's trick is convincing leaders that war is desirable, the rest of us that it's acceptable, and combatants that everything they are doing and seeing is normal or at least 
necessary. So that's why it's called the devil's trick. Here's a short answer to the short question. <laughs> well, thanks, John. And, and thanks, Raphael, for a great question. Um, uh, several of us were just messaging in the chat, Kevin and myself, that we wanted that to be a question asked because it was a very interesting one. Um, John, why don't I ask you one last question, then we can wrap sure. things up for tonight. Um, I got a question here from, um, from Richard Savard in Victoria. Uh, he's wondering how many Americans came to Canada to avoid the war and what percentage of them returned to the United States when they were pardoned. It's about, and again, about, um, because when they arrived at the border, um, they were not asked um, whether they are leaving because they're dodging the draft there or, or anything like that. So they weren't asked that. Deserters were because they, they asked to see if their uh, record of military and the people who were... Um, who were, who were draft dodging had no record, so therefore they just came in. So they knew about the number of deserters that came in, and the deserters were given a rough time um, um, in coming over. Uh, but the draft dodgers were not asked. And so therefore, the 30,000 is an estimate of how many came over. And of that 30,000, it is interesting that when President Carter was elected um, president, and one of the first thing he did in the second day that he was in the Oval Office is he granted amnesty to all of the draft dodgers, not the deserters. So all of the draft dodgers could come home. And the American news networks went to a number of the border crossings um, the next couple of days to, to welcome the waves of Americans that were going to come back and, and hardly anybody came. They were disappointed. Many of the draft dodgers had become Canadian. One of the things that I talk about in the book is the numbers that entered universities, both as students, and then uh, with gaining their PhDs became university profs. And there was a big fight in uh, Canadian universities in the late 60s and early 70s about all these draft dodgers coming in here. So the number that came, about 30,000. The number that went back is estimated at anywhere between two and 3,000, less than 10%. John, I'm going to fit in one more because you're so succinct. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's another good one because I remember this is a story that my dad told me um, when he was, uh, he taught a course at the University of Saskatchewan on uh, Canadian foreign policy. Um, and so he would often tell me this story when he would get uh, to the to the period when he was talking about uh, Canada's involvement in the Vietnam War or just foreign policy in the 1950s and 1960s post-war Canada. Um, that famous question of Johnson holding up Pearson by his lapels and shaking him out that's by what his ranch. Yes. Yeah, what happened was it was 1965 and Pearson uh, was um, about to be given uh, an award, a peace award. Our you know, Nobel Prize winning prime minister was about to be given another honor. And it was at Temple University in Philadelphia. So he went down and he delivered a speech um, as part of accepting this um, international honor. And uh, in that speech, he praised Johnson. He praised the Vietnam War. He praised the Americans standing up against communism. But he said, I believe that a tactic that President Johnson is using, that is the bombing of cities, um, is murdering civilians and the killing of civilians is not a way to eventually win a war. All it will do is build resistance to um, the Americans and prolong that war. So a lot of people remember him criticizing the, the war, but he wasn't. He was criticizing just the tactic being used in the war. He left the stage and there was a phone call waiting for him waiting for him. He's just off the stage, inviting him to lunch. So up he went to Camp David the next day. When he arrived for lunch, there was um, um, Johnson at the end of the table screaming into a phone at uh, McNamara, cursing and swearing as only President Johnson could do um, about the way the war was being handled and about other things. Ignored John, uh, Pearson as he picked at his food. Finally, slammed down his phone, slammed down his cutlery, and said, you come with me took him out to a little outdoor terrace and ripped into the prime minister for the speech at Temple University the day before, grabbed him by the lapels of his jacket, lifted him um, onto his toes, and he said, you don't come in here and piss on my rug and let him go. Well, how's that for the matter of uh, 
of, I, I think that beats uh, Trump being mad at Justin Trudeau. And there is Canadian American relations. And what did Pearson do the next day? Back in Ottawa, he wrote him elect, uh, Johnson a letter and thanked him for his uh, frank um, assessment of his Temple University speech. And what happened right after that, as I said, Canadian trade agreements moved on. There was nothing that happened after that. No repercussions whatsoever, except he got what is historians call the full Johnson treatment, the nose to nose treatment. <laughs> I don't think Justin Trudeau would be picked up by Joe Biden right now. I think we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, John, uh, I think that's a great note to to end on. Um, I just want to say, um, again, thank you so much for generously giving us your time to speak about your new book. Um, I'll again, just, you know, remind folks that are here tonight that really enjoyed John's talk and, you know, might want to learn more about uh, Canada's involvement in the Vietnam War. I've included the link uh, to purchase John's book, The Devil's Trick, um, for you at Chapters. Um, it's on for $32 right now. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, I hope you'll go out and buy the book because this was just a, a small taste um, into what he's he's put together um, in book form. So our next event is going to take place at, you know, the usual time, seven o'clock PM Eastern time on the 16th of February. Um, and the next talk will feature philosopher from the University of Guelph, Maya Goldenberg, who will help us answer the question, is there a war on science? And looking at that question through the lens of vaccine hesitancy. And I guarantee you, even though I have not actually heard her give this talk yet, that the answer she will provide is not the one uh, that you would expect. So if you're interested in registering for this event, please visit, again, as Kevin said, our new website, studyofcanada.ca. Click on events at the top of the page, the events tab, and scroll down to public lectures. And from there, you will see um, Dr. Goldenberg's lecture upcoming and a number of others that are hosted uh, through the Guelph Civic Museum and then also ours um, in March. So please go there. Um, you, will, you will actually get directed to our new website as soon as you end the webinar tonight. Um, so for, for ease sake, you can, can easily access um, those registration pages as you need them. Um, finally, if you enjoyed tonight's webinar and would like to kind of know about what's happening at the Laurier Center for the Study of Canada, uh, where we're headed in this new direction with a new mandate. Um, you can scroll down to the bottom of the page um, and enter in your details to subscribe. And from there, you will receive periodic emails from us about new podcasts, webinars, such as the one you've just listened to, publications, and of course, the Canadian Military History Colloquium, which is actually going to be taking place in May of this year. We are currently encouraging those that would like to present to submit papers. Um, and again, you can find all of that information on our new website, studyofcanada.ca, which I've included in the chat. Uh, once again, John, thanks again. Uh, we hope that we'll have you, we'll be able to bring you back again uh, for the next book. Um, but of course, hopefully it will not be in a webinar format, but we'll be able to host it back in person again. So we can have all of those fun in-person interactions, eat our, our usual Zares donuts that we like to provide for our <laughs> audience. And of course that you can sign copies and people can go home with that, with a fresh copy, which is so much, um, I think just so much um, more, more rich than purchasing something online. I agree. Thank you very much for the invitation. Next time will be in person. That sounds good. And thanks to everyone for tuning in tonight. Um, of course, if you have any questions, um, you know, about the center, send them directly to Kevin K. Spooner at WLU.ca. I've included uh, it in the chat. And hopefully we will see you at our next webinar in February with Maya Goldenberg. In the meantime, stay safe, take care everyone, and we'll see you around sometime very soon. Have a great night.